Please join me in welcoming Les McCowan. Uh, anyway, it's great to be here. <clears throat> it really is a pleasure. I want to share uh, with you some things that um, I've noticed along the way of um, launching and running businesses. And as uh, Catherine has mentioned, uh, what I'm going to share with you doesn't come from, I, I, I hope you'll forgive me, from an academic background. I'm going to share with you what I've seen observationally in my own career. <clears throat> so I was a, uh, originally a CPA, qualified um, as a chartered accountant, which is the UK equivalent. Um, went into practice not because I was really that interested in uh, accounting and certainly not the legacy business of doing tax and, and so forth. I wanted to learn how businesses worked. I began because of the environment that I started with in back in the UK at that time to help people with the startup process. There was a lot of entrepreneurship uh, going on right then. And uh, as time went on, people began to ask me if I would go beyond just helping them put together projections or business plans. And they would ask me if I was interested in getting involved in some of the business ideas with them. Essentially, I got the, I got the opportunity to cherry pick a lot of really good business opportunities as they came along. And that was really why I was doing this, because I wanted to get involved hands-on in business. So fast forward the video. Uh, by the way, uh, as you might have already guessed, the major communication barrier we're going to have is my accent. Uh, I'm not from Texas. <laughs> I'm from Belfast in Ireland. So, uh, and this is not Gaelic. Uh, this is strangulated English. It'll just take a while for, uh, the, for the cadence to catch up. Uh, the word you're going to have most trouble with is it. It is a number between seven and nine. And part of a whole lot of words. So, to it, then. By the way, you want to go to Ireland, Northern Ireland, and sound like a local, just go around saying it. All the, it, it, it. No idea where I'd got to with that. Oh, yes. Um, so, um, I got the opportunity to start businesses like a graphic design agency, PR company, uh, a tool and die manufacturing business, which you probably couldn't start on a Western economy right now. Um, I bought and started the uh, master license for Pizza Hut in Ireland. So trying to coax Irish people to eat flat Italian bread was my first major strategic challenge. <laughs> Any of you have ever visited Ireland, you know we don't really have a cuisine. We've just got substantially varied ways of cooking potatoes. <laughs> so I was the first, and I think still the only uh, Pizza Hut franchisee who genuinely got permission to produce chips, fries. And our first restaurant was the only Pizza Hut ever that made fries, because only, we couldn't get people in the door if potato was on the menu somewhere. <laughs> and th th I think they assumed it was another topping. You know, so I'll have that with fries meant put it on top. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with the Pizza Hut franchise. <clears throat> and I, I got to the age 35, I'd done 42 businesses, um, most of them with other people, a few of them uh, uh, by myself. And usually what would happen is that uh, I would run them for a couple of years or co-run uh, them for a few years along with a portfolio of uh, four or five at one time. And then I'd sell them back to the partners that I started with. And um, two of them failed. I learned a lot from the failures. I probably learned as much of what I'm going to share with you in a moment or two from the failures as I did from the successes. Um, about that time, uh, the uh, UK government, or a branch of it, asked me if I would, uh, with another serial entrepreneur, uh, a guy who became a really close friend of mine, I already knew him. Uh, sadly, uh, a <laughs> terrible thing to, uh, to bring into a, a, an address, I guess, but the poor chap just died last week. Uh, I spent 12 years of my life with this guy running an incubation business to help other people launch businesses. Um, they had essentially seen what uh, Will, my colleague, and I had been doing as serial entrepreneurs, and they asked us, could we put together some sort of a program that would help train other people to launch businesses? It was really retailing uh, uh, what we'd been doing wholesale. Uh, so we had no idea what we were doing. We picked up a few books. Um, on the uh, theory of business growth and put it together with what we knew. Um, there was some stuff coming out of Babson about then. We used some of that. And we wrote a curriculum, and the two of us began to teach it. And uh, Will and I spent the, the next decade 
uh, building that incubation business up beyond just pr uh, business launch to helping people that had already launched then grow their businesses further. Um, that got to about uh, 110 people, 13 offices around the world, um, helping launch businesses in different cultures. And one of the things that started to happen was as we began to do this in culturally different backgrounds, and I've already done an awful lot of different industries, a, a few commonalities began to become very clear, things that happen to all organizations. And it's those that I want to share with you today. And I want to wrap around it um, a little bit of additional stuff about what I've seen about how some people succeed. I really like this. Um, uh, Dora, uh, uh, it's always fun to give the speaker a shot is in the plastic box so that you can have real fun watching me tear out this with my teeth. And, but because of that, look, I brought my own jiffy back. There's a, I'm only teasing, Dora. And there's a very tiny um, set of expandable trousers in here in case I get wet again this afternoon. So um, here's what... Essentially, so I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not going to use any uh, overheads. Uh, but what I want to show you, we would be more than happy to send you a PDF that sort of summarizes the whole thing. So if you just want to relax and, and watch what I'm going through, uh, I'll tell you then how you can get hold of this. Um, what I discovered as I watched all of these businesses and worked with them was that <clears throat> every organization goes through seven stages. Um, they're inviolable. You can't not go through these various stages of development. Uh, what you can do is you can pause and stay in one or other of the stages. Some of them, as you'll see, you might even want to do that, and others you would not. Uh, there's no need to go the whole way through all of the stages to the very end. But as you progress, you do it, organizations do it sequentially. What I discovered after I did this, I'm going to share this mostly with you in the context of business. But what I discovered pretty soon after I published uh, my first book, Predictable Success, that shows all of this, is people started calling me from non-business environments and telling me that they were using the model and using it very successfully. And what uh, occurred to me uh, eventually, and has become a large part of what I do, is that the um, patterns that I'm going to show you actually apply to any group of two or more people trying to achieve common goals. So whether you want to go into business, whether you want to go work for a nonprofit, whether you want to ever be in a relationship, uh, any group of two or more people trying to achieve common goals go through this uh, cycle that I'm going to share with you. And as you can see from my uh, incredibly uh, well-realized uh, um, graphic here, there are four of the stages that are somewhat rocky. They're dangerous for the organization. There are three of the stages that look like uh, they're safe harbors, that they're good places to be. As you're going to see in a moment or two, one of them is an illusion. And so that just leaves us with two optimal stages out of seven that an organization can find itself in. i uh, help you see what those are and also see which of them is best for an organization to be in, depending on what type of an organization, business, for-profit, not-for-profit it is. And along the way, I hope what I'm going to help you see <clears throat> is where you might best fit in as you make career choices going down the line. Because one of the ha things that happens to us uh, in making co career choices is we tend to not think a lot about this. You might think broadly about whether you want to work for a small company, a large company, a small organization, a large organization, but the exposure and transparency I'm going to give you to what it's really like to be in one of these stages may well be very helpful for you, particularly when you match it to your own natural style and find out which of these is going to be a good fit for you. So let me take you through these real quick. And I, I'm going to spend uh, uh, 40 minutes or so taking you through this, and then I'm going to uh, spend the rest of our time taking questions, so um, feel free to uh, jot down anything that doesn't make a lot of sense to you that you want to talk about. The first um, stage here is something that pretty intuitively named, I call it early struggle. It's an early struggle. Every organization starts by having an early struggle. Anybody want to take a shot at what, let's talk about it just in the business commercial sense, what's the early struggle for? What are we struggling, are you going to have to shout? What are we struggling for? Just recognition. 
Somebody said money. Is it just any sort of money? If you throw any sort of cash at a business, if you started a business um, to make chairs and you're struggling to get it off the ground, if I just come and write you a check, you've got some money, are your problems over at that point? No. Where do you need to get money from to have a value? Customers. 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 Any struggle is a race against time. It's a race to replace one type of, in, of um, cash, external funding, I'm sure you're learning a lot about external funding, with another source of cash, which is the cash that comes from a market. And not just any market, it's got to be a sustainable, profitable market. And that's what early struggle is all about. Can we get to find a profitable, sustainable market before the money runs out? Can you see that the market needs to be a market and not just a customer? That you can find one customer and think you've got your business viable? I mean, if Walmart came along and gave you a massive order for your chairs, you might think you've got a business that's out of early struggle. But I hope you can see that that's not the case. All you've done is you find one customer. It might be a good customer. It might numb the effect of this race against time for six months or a year, but eventually you're going to have to find a market. The market's got to be sustainable. And it's got to be profitable. If you're working for a non-profit, the equivalent of that is finding a version of what we heard earlier, recognition, getting a, an established group of people who want to avail of whatever service you're bringing. But the first stage every organization goes through is a race against time to get through early struggle before the money runs out. There's one um, part of industry which we've just begun to see in recent years is having a distorting effect on this, much as it did some time ago, and that's tech. And one of the things that happens in tech is that the whole business of having a race against time to find a sustainable, profitable market ceases to be the goal. The goal is to get somebody to buy you out as soon as possible. And in order to do that, we can keep tapping into additional venture funding and keep putting off the day for when we have to find a sustainable, profitable market. I'm sure you've read and seen all of that, and that's fine. And I have a lot of uh, uh, high regard for people who manage to go and scam a million, uh, sorry, take a lot of money from investors. Uh, that's great, but that has nothing to do with this. Because that's not a mindset that says, I want to build a business that produces something and services a market. That's about saying, I want to uncover this thing and sell it to somebody very quickly. That's a different mentality. You want to build a business, you've got to find yourself a sustainable, profitable market. This is typically, uh, for most businesses, about a three to five year period. Might sound forever, but that's the way it goes. Service businesses can get out of early struggle quicker than manufacturing businesses. Manufacturing businesses need longer to get and build that um, sustainable, profitable uh, market, mostly because their lead time, their cycle time is longer from finding somebody that might be a customer to turning them into a customer, so three to five years. As you might imagine, this is a very dangerous time for any organization. There's a very high mortality rate. You might have read some statistics about the percentage of businesses that don't make it past the first three years. You want to take, give it a shot? Uh, how many businesses do you think fell in the first three to five years? What do you reckon? OK, the answer I'm hearing from you is mm -hmm. So uh, 70%. 90%. 124%. Uh, the IRS will tell you it's about two-thirds. Their recorded numbers are about uh, two-thirds of all organizations, don't, businesses don't make it after the first three years. Um, unfortunately, and, and I know this from my days uh, practicing as a CPA, an uh, enormous amount of businesses never file with the IRS. They never get that far 
They just never file. They die in the first year, and the records never appear. Uh, my experience is that 80% of all new ventures fail. So only one in five organizations make it through here into the next stage. The good news is if you do make it through um, early struggle, you find your profitable, sustainable market, you hit the second stage, which, as you can see, is a period of growth in the organization, perhaps not just as you know, straight up as I've drawn, but that's only because of the shape of the paper. Right? Um, but it is typically a period of high growth. And I've given this second stage the highly technical name of fun. And I've called it that because that's what it is. It's fun. It's when business really is fun. Uh, you've had a tough couple of years. You've been trying to find your uh, profitable, sustainable uh, market. You've found the market. And that can be really painful. You know, going through early struggle is like waking up every morning with a vice on the back of your neck. Just for those of you. Any of you contemplating starting your own business? Not a single, four people, four brave people, four, four sorry, brave people. Um, starting your own business uh, in this early stage is really, really tough. You're waking up every morning thinking, am I going to be able to meet payroll next Thursday? Am I going to be able to pay my suppliers this weekend? Am I going to be able to, tell, to give the customer what I told them I would give them? And when I start getting something, because I haven't paid myself since we started, it's really, really tough. It's a hard, hard process, a hard time. And so what happens whenever you finally find your market is the business begins to grow really fast. Because a lot of the pent up passion that's been held back during early struggle gets released. <clears throat> and what's been happening here during early struggle, we've had this focus on needing to get cash to stay alive until we find our market. What we've been doing here in early struggle is trying to find the market. We're trying to find our market. And now we've found it in fun, we mine it. We're mining the market. It's there, and there's lots of low-hanging fruit. There's lots of stuff we can go get. And so the business begins to grow really, really fast. In fun, if it was all about cash down here, in fun, it's all about sales. Sell, 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 sell. What do you think the market share is of, the, of this little business as it just comes out of early struggle? What, do you, what sort of size of market do you think it might have? Big market share or small? Small. It's going to be 0 .00 something of something, which is Irish for not a lot. 2% of the square root of not a lot. So you're starting with this tiny little percentage. And arithmetically, it's really easy to get double-digit, triple-digit growth for maybe a couple of years, three years, four years, five years, six years. And I've seen organizations in fun for eight, 10, 15 years. You get the eight there? <laughs> eight, 10, 15 years. And the business begins to grow really, really fast. Now, I want to step back here a little bit and uh, maybe show you a little bit of what's going on before we hit these other levels. I want to show you a bit more of what's going on underneath the surface. Let's go back to the early struggle stage and just watch what's happening. Any of you know anybody who started a business? You know a family member or somebody who's started something up? Cool. What words would you use to describe somebody who m may well have a perfectly good job, but you know they're sitting at their kitchen table at 4 a.m. scribbling away, trying to work out a business plan to start a new business? Maybe you're going to give up a, a, a paycheck to do this. What sort of words come to mind when you think about people who start businesses? <laughs> Yawn at them a lot. Drum my fingers. Passionate. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. We don't tell them that. We say they're brave, right? <laughs> Depends how close you are to them. But you think crazy, you say brave. These are the visionaries. Every new venture starts with a visionary. Always. There's all, every successful new venture starts with a visionary. Even the oldest, most boring business you can think of somewhere had a visionary right back at the roots who sat on a kitchen table for 4 a.m. thinking, I can't stand this. I need to start my own thing. They tend to be passionate people. Uh, they tend to be risk takers. They're certainly prepared to take risks sometimes, 
a visionary can kill a flip chart. Stay there. No, it's going to die on me. One dead flip chart. Dave, do you want to come up and see if you can? A visionary. I love to do this. This is my son, Dave. Would you give him a round of applause? Dave's the CEO all of my business. Started with me three weeks ago. And since then, all he's done is wrestle with flip charts. That's all his orientation period has included. Now, if you can just for a moment ignore them and watch me. Uh, these movies are passionate. They're risk takers. At their extreme, uh, visionaries aren't just risk takers. They actually have to have risk. They're addicted to risk. And if they don't get it, they feel very uncomfortable. Let's see if you did it or not. Everybody hold your breath, all right? Take a walk of shame there, big guy. Go on. Um, they're typically um, they're good communicators. Sometimes they're charismatic, not always. But they've usually got something about them that marks them out. You can usually tell visionary when they come into a room. They're driven, and they don't give up easily. Can you see that that's what's necessary to get out of early struggle? That if you didn't have that type of visionary right at the outset, that the sheer beat down that early struggle is would put the business's lights out. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the mortality rate is so high, is that without a visionary, eventually the business doesn't make it through the fifth, the sixth, the seventh cash crunch that it has. One of the things, therefore, for you folks who might think of going to work for a startup is make sure there's a strong visionary. If there isn't a strong visionary there, it almost certainly isn't going to make it. I'd go so far as to say 100%, except nothing in life is 100%. But in my observation, it's pretty close to that. Now, here's the thing. I want you to imagine just for a minute you're a banker. You've got a bunch of money, and somebody comes along, and these are the only characteristics they have. Nothing else. They're just passionate, really passionate, visionary. They see the big picture. They can, they can come in, they sit down, they tell you what they want to do. They've got this product, and it's going to you know, cure this thing or do that thing. They're really, really enthusiastic. If that was all they had, would you give them the money? No. No. What's missing? What's that? Not just the existence of the plan, but what do you need to do with the plan? You need to make it work. And typically what happens is this. Visions, uh, visionaries are very, very passionate. And they will tell you, this is the single most important squirrel. <laughs> this business that we're engaged in will be the great, oh, look at that. Squirrel. Squirrel. Any of you seen Up, the Pixar movie? Yeah. The dog loves the journey. He's on it. Squirrel. He's really, really obsessed with what's going on until squirrel. Well, that's what visionaries are like. They've got, I mean, it's, it's um, uh, commonplace today to talk about ADHD as if it's, you know, measles or something, but they've got something that approaches to the inability to concentrate on granular things. Here's what happens to a visionary. When they've seen the vision, when they see what it is that they want to do, the act of seeing it is 75% of the whole thing, and they get really bored with the other 25%. Actually, grinding it out doesn't come naturally to them. So what happens to those organizations that make it successfully out of early struggle is that very early on, visionaries tend to link, not tend to, if they're successful, what they do do is they, up, they link themselves to somebody that I call the operator. A visionary will find somebody who is a complementary, not the opposite, but a complementary style to them. And the operator is the person who focuses on the short term, focuses on tasks, focuses on getting the vision done. Operators will go through walls to make things happen. 
and they take the visionary's picture, they break it down, they go out and make it happen. And visionary and operator together are what make successful businesses. A visionary on their own, I want you to think about a startup that's people just with a visionary or half or fend two, three, four visionaries. Can you imagine what that's like? It's all talk. We had a great day. We bought our own chairs. Yay! <laughs> we didn't get one step closer to finding our profitable, sustainable market, but watch me do wheelies in this new chair. Huh? Or here's another new product that we'll launch. But we haven't got the first one out the gate yet. Or why don't we all open an office in Chicago? We can't pay for the one in Pennsylvania. Visionaries, great, brilliant ideas but not hammering it out at the, at the granular level. Operators are the ones that hammer out the great ideas, but if you're to start up just with some operators, what's the missing piece? It's the vision, it's the strategy, it's the plan, what are we doing? So it's all a ton of action, but it doesn't add up to anything. That's very rare to see that because operators tend not to start businesses. They tend to know not to try to start a business unless they find a visionary to work with. And so this combination, the visionary operator combination, it's essentially what you'd call a, a mom and pop. They may not be those genders, but that's essentially a mom and pop model. If you've got a favorite local diner that you go to, or a muffler sto store, or a graphic design agency, small one that you really like, and they're doing really well, and they're in this fun stage and growing, it's almost certainly a visionary operator, mom and pop type of a relationship. You go to the diner and pops out front, and he's glad handing everybody, how's the family, how was your vacation, blah, 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 being all visionary. And mom's in the back making sure that we've got enough cheese for the morning, that our tills balance, that the, the tables are being bust. It's that visionary operator combination that takes the organization through early struggle and into fun. And unless you have both of those, you will not have a successful Uh, startup. Uh, so again, for those of you who might think of going to work in a, let me just throw it all out here, going to work in a startup, you want to look not just for the visionary, but you want to make sure that there's an operator there as well. Which of them is easiest to see, do you think? Which is more visible? The visionary. The visionary is the one who's taking all the front, right? The visionary is the one taking all the meetings. You know, uh, uh, just endearing everybody with the picture of the business and what it's going to do. The operator's not in the meetings. The operators loathe meetings. They want to get out and make the thing happen. They say, yeah, sure, you take, take the meeting. An operator would t rather take a paper clip, open it up, and stab themselves in the eye than sit in a meeting. I just want to do this thing. You take the meeting. I'm fine. These make a really good, highly effective couple. They're symbiotic. symbiotic. They feed off each other. The best of them as teams can finish each other's sentences. They're incredibly flexible. They're fun to work for and with. But the way they're growing the business is by improvising, by innovating, by making it up as they go along. And the reason why customers like them and give them business is they'll do whatever it takes. And so you have the business typically with a V and more than one operator. It's going to be maybe an Uber operator and then a couple of other operators really driving the business and making it grow. By the way, which of the visionary and the operator do you think typically has most of the equity of the business? Yeah. The operator's got more share capital? No. Who was the one at the kitchen table? Whose idea was it? It was the visionary. The visionary is typical of the business owner. And the operator may have some minority shares, but more likely what they're doing is they're building sweat equity over time. They're building a relationship with the visionary that gives them loyalty and access. The business grows like crazy. It goes through fun. And before you know it, the business becomes something very different. Something happens after a couple of years in fun. We start to sell, and we sell more, and then a little more, and then a little more, and we get more customers. We offer more product lines. We offer more service lines. We offer, open in a new location. What's happening to the business over time? It's becoming what? Becoming 
bigger, Leslie. Bigger. Oh, it's becoming bigger. <laughs> and what does size bring with it? Complexity. The business becomes complex. And what happens here is we have a business that's doing really well and fun because it's delivering consistent quality in the face of simplicity. It's a relatively simple business. So it can give quality to its customers, and then it grows. When it grows, it becomes complex. And at some point, the business hits this stage that I call white water. And in white water, we've quite simply become too complex to make it up every morning. All right? For the visual and the operator, every day during fun is like every day for a duck. Zero memory of what went before. It's like my golden retriever. I say to Alfie, you want to go for a walk? Alfie says, a walk? Are you kidding me? That is my favorite thing. <laughs> now, I'm somewhat making the dog into a person here. I hope you realize that. It doesn't actually say those things. But you know what? I can take Alfie for a darn walk. And an hour later, I can say, Alfie, you want to go for a walk? Are you kidding me? A walk? That's my favorite thing. I probably should have called the dog Will Fowl instead of Alpha, but anyway. But that's what it's like for the visionary and operator. It's like every day, we get to do this, we get to do this, this is fun, this is fun, this is fun. And then slowly, over time, the business becomes more complex. And this way of viscerally running the business by just turning up each day and responding to whatever shining most begins to collapse in on itself. And the business needs what? If it's become more complex, what do you think it needs to master complexity? It's not a hard question. Systems and processes. It's not difficult. Intellectually very easy to see. We're complex, so we need systems and processes. What do you think the visionary and operator are like as far as systems and processes are concerned? You think they like them? No. They loathe them. Number one reason people start businesses is autonomy and freedom. They start businesses because they want to be free of systems and processes. Money always comes second, but it's a measuring stick for autonomy and freedom. So what happens is that the VO discover very soon <clears throat> that they haven't got what it takes to put the systems and processes in place. And so they go out and find themselves what I call a processor. They go get somebody who's going to come in and put some systems and processes in place. And the VO and P together work to get the business through Whitewater, to put the systems and processes in place. It's really a coming of age of businesses. Up until then, we've been a mom and pop. Now we're having to learn to work, to walk and chew gum at the same time. The business is becoming adult. It's becoming mature. And so we might, might hire a CPA uh, as our, as our uh, general accountant or as our CFO. We might get an IT person in to start running IT professionally because we need that. Maybe it's HR, human resources. We need to be more professional now. We need systems and processes because we got, just got sued for the fourth time. Maybe it's an engineer to bring some quality control to our production processes because our recalls got too high when we hit white water. Whatever it is, and it's different from business to business, we need to get a processor on board. And so we go ahead and we hire somebody with a green eye shade who's risk averse, who doesn't like the idea of ambiguity, who wants to nail everything down, wants to squeeze out variance. Now, how do you think the visionary operator and processor get on? What do you think the visionary and operator think about this new hire who's going to put systems and processes in place? They don't. They don't, thank you. At least eventually they don't. Initially, it all seems great because the visionary and operator know they need systems and processes, and we got a new processor. Oh, it's all super. And the operator who's been firefighting like crazy, fixing all of this stuff, thinks the cavalry has arrived. Because here's the thing, the operator is the firefighter fixing stuff in Whitewater. The visionary is the arsonist. <laughs> right? It's the visionary walking around with a book of matches. They just love setting fire to stuff. <laughs> Don't like that anymore, let's not do that. Let's open an office in Chicago. Why would we open an office in Chicago? I met this guy. He's really good. You like him? Did we have any strategic intent of opening an office in Chicago? God, no. 
a little bit fun. And so the operator thinks they're going to get some support here and slowing things down. The visionary knows that we need systems and processes, but who do you think the visionary thinks the systems and processes are for? Everybody but them. Everybody but them. They started the business so that they could be free. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to bore you with it. And almost always, this doesn't take. And the processor gets marginalized. The visionary won't play ball because they want to do their own thing. The operator loves it at the start, but then really begins to bridle at being called in the meetings and being told to fill forms in and make things work. And they get really irritated at how everything seems to be slowing down. And typically, the processor becomes marginalized to the point where they leave. And then the business goes through this cycle two or three times because it goes back to fun, starts to grow again, needs a processor. And it's usually the third or fourth time before finally the visionary and operator work out that they need a processor and they've got to learn to respect that person. And they've got to learn to respect their different ways of working. There's the operator who is first in, last out, all day, every day. And the processor who's coming in at 8 o'clock in the morning, because that's what the manual says, and leaving at 5 p.m., because that's what the manual says. And the visionary coming in just whenever they want, leaving whenever they want. And this is all getting on each other's nerves. And eventually, they learn to get beyond that. And the organization moves into a stage that I call predictable success, where the visionary and operator and processor have learned to work together as a team. And I want to finish this side of the model off real quickly for you and explain what happens next. We put systems and processes in place. We've now got a well-balanced business that can scale. If we put systems and processes in place and that was a good thing, what do you think we do next? Put in some more. What typically happens is the processor begins to dominate in the organization. Here, they couldn't get any traction. We begin to get it to work. The processor begins to dominate. And the organization falls forward into a decline stage that I call treadmill. And in treadmill, the organization is simply over-processed. We're too dependent on systems and processes. It's all about completing the checklists. The processors are running the ship. Everything is about compliance. You've got to fill in 16 forms to get your pencil sharpened. Who uses pencils these days? Change that metaphor, outdated metaphor. You've got to fill in 17 forms to get your BlackBerry. No, that's worse. Never mind. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. And so the organization falls into this stage I call treadmill. Now, that's a natural stage. happens to everybody. And what happens in treadmill is that the organization is self-aware, and somebody can put their hands up and say, hey, this is crazy. Our, our f we shouldn't be putting people through five screens to sign up as a potential new customer. Let's pull this down to one screen. We're over-processed. And if that's the case, we go back into predictable success. <clears throat> if we don't get it right, we stay in treadmill for too long, the organization loses the ability to self-diagnose. It falls into what I call the big rut, which is a long period of decline. It doesn't go like this. It goes away out here, because there's typically a lot of money in the balance sheet that the organization has made over time. And at this point, typically, the visionary has gone. And we've just got the operator and the processors moving things around. The business has lost its sense of vision. I believe this is what happened to Microsoft over the last two years. It moved from treadmill, where it lacked a vision but had a chance of making it work, to the point where now it's in the big rut. They've lost the ability to self-diagnose. And it's just a question of time, it may be a long time, before it hits the final stage, which I call death rattle. And death rattle is simply that. It's the end of the business. Uh, everything runs out. Time runs out, and the organization is broken up. Somebody buys the assets, somebody buys the customer list, somebody buys the name, somebody buys the patents, and it's over. It might take a long time to go through the big rut uh, and die, but it'll happen eventually. So what I want to do is finish um, here with this, but what I want to point out to you is something from a career perspective. If you've got a processor mindset, and you like systems and process, and I would include people who are doing stuff like CPA, uh, like engineering, and so forth. Which side of this um, cycle do you think you're going to be most welcomed and valued in? Probably over here. 
Where will you get most challenge? Probably over here. If you're a hard driver who doesn't like being held back by systems and processes, but you're not necessarily a big blue stormer, you're an operator. And you're going to be absolutely in heaven here. This is where operators love working. Business has got out of early struggle. It's profitable. But you can get a lot of autonomy. You can get a lot of freedom to do your own thing. You work up here in an operator, as an operator, it's really constricting. And those of you that are in our business, I don't need to tell you anything because you're already saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm starting my own business. I'm going to stop at that point, uh, given our time constraints. I want to leave a little bit of time for uh, questions. But I hope it's been helpful and useful to you. Thank you. We got time for a couple of questions? Yeah. I'll ask the first question. Um, you could also say that Apple might be entering this big rut as well. But the, if you find yourself entering the big rut, uh, thank you, um, how can you get out of it? I mean, I, I'm sure that when you're dealing with Fortune 500 companies, I mean, that's the issue, right? I mean, many of them have become processors, as you say. They've lost the creative, entrepreneurial spirit of vision. If you're, some of them are able to get out of that. I'm just curious no. how, how you advise no, them. No, you can't. If the organization is in the big rut, you cannot get out. That's the, the definition of the big rut. If you're in treadmill, you can get out because you're self, you can self-diagnose and you'll do what's right to fix it. What can happen is a division or a department can get into the big rut uh, or a project and you can pull it back up. But the only way to take an organization out of the big rut is you've got to completely decapitate all of senior management. You realize I'm talking metaphorically there, right? You've got to take them all out. Um, if you leave even the good people in there, the systems and processes will drag them down. So I'll give you a good example, and then we'll take another question. General Motors is in the big rut. And the fact that it's just posted some good results doesn't mean that it's over. And the problem, the reason why they're still in the big rut is that they were in the big rut before TARP. And all they did was give them money. And they changed a few of the people at the top. They would have had to completely take out all of management for it to have stood a chance of getting back to treadmill. And this takes a long time, but I'd say within a decade or 15 years, GM will be back on its knees again, would be my bet. Another question? Young lady there with her hand in the air probably means I want to ask a question. Okay. Or wait for the microphone. Um, how does identifying these different stages vary by industry, or does it not vary at all? No, it doesn't vary at all. Um, what happens is that you typically spend less time in each stage if you're more on the service side of business, and longer in each stage if you're in a manufacturing uh, business because the cycles are just longer. But every organization of any, uh, of any industry will go through these stages one, uh, one step at a time. Yeah, Say it again? certain cues to like um, identify when a company is transitioning from one stage to another? Yeah, we, there are. I would, and sadly, I honestly don't have time to go through them all, but there are some very specific things that tell you. I'll, I'll just give you one. Uh, the one thing that tells you that you're moving into treadmill more than anything else is that the word compliance gets spoken a lot. You begin to talk about compliance, and there are those sorts of clues, auditory and others, in every one of the stages. By the way, just you've reminded me at one point, um, setting the life cycle side aside, if you want to know what your style is, visionary operator, uh, processor, uh, or a fourth style, which I didn't talk about, which synergist style, which is the, the learned style that runs businesses successful and predictable success, you can go to just synergist quiz, synergistquiz.com, all one word. There's a free quiz there, 22 questions, take you three or four minutes, and it'll tell you exactly what you're at. Um, what you can do if you want a PDF of all of this, when you get the results page, You'll see a box to put your email address in. Just put in an email address, type in the comments column, column that you were part of the uh, uh, Georgia Tech thing, and we'll send you a PDF. Another question? Les, I, I have a question, and it's about, um, it's about BlackBerry. So they, <laughs> and I just wanted to get your thoughts, because not only did RIM change their brand to BlackBerry today, but also just diagnose where you think they are um, and does, does changing a brand have any impact on the business? Uh, no, and they're definitely here. They're in yeah. the big rut. Uh, they only get out by selling. That's the only way. That's the only salvation. And Paul, we were talking about cues earlier on. Um, Co-CEOs co is a sure sign of a business that's struggling very hard to think of how to get out of treadmill. It never works. And as soon as they announced co-CEOs, co I think it was three to four years ago, 
I knew it was only a matter of time before they slid from treadmill into the big rut. And Blackberry is one of the saddest stories because there's absolutely no reason for them to be there. They don't need to be there. We done? One more, just in the back. Um, take this one. Well, I'm, I'm not going anymore, so I'll take as many as you want. You tell me when you're done. Um, so you spend a lot of time working with businesses as like a consultant, kind of getting them into predictive success. And you recently wrote an article talking about like the four signs of a, an ineffective leader. Uh, when you see these signs, how do you actually tell these leaders? Because you mentioned sometimes they're not even aware that what they're doing is running their business into the ground, into treadmill and the big rut stages. Um, well, first of all, I refuse to answer questions of anybody who's done any research about anything that I've done before you'd come here. That's just sneaky and, and really, no, I'm only teasing. Thank you for that. Um, I, my own uh, personal uh, approach is I don't work with folks that don't have self-awareness. I write those articles to help engender self-awareness, but if I'm uh, put in front of somebody and they don't have the ability to see that they need to make some changes. I'm just, I'm far too old to be bothered trying to persuade them to do it, right? Uh, I'm not gonna jump up and down and say, you need to do this, you need to do this. So I only work with people who've got self-awareness and who wanna make a change, and then I help them affect that change. And I, and I, I vent in the articles, which then causes some people some, and you may, if you've noticed uh, the uh, articles, um, I write them in a very controversial, in-your-face manner in order to just perhaps save one or two people who may say, oh, you know, uh, maybe I'm not perfect after all. <laughs> They'd be from Tennessee, those people, right, with that accent. Les, I'm one here. So you've been talking about all these labels. How would you label yourself? Uh, I'm a visionary processor, which is a very unusual combination in, in, uh, normal, in the normal world, but it's quite common in consultants. So I like to get the big picture, and I love putting the systems and processes in place to make it work, but I don't want to get my hands dirty and actually do any of it. Um, I burned my operator side out um, in my 30s, so I'm a VP. Okay. Um, I'm, I wanted to ask, you know, how do you even get to the early struggle? Um, as an entrepreneur, the hardest part is sometimes finding the idea of the business in the first place? Um, or do you find one that's already starting, jump on, help them out, get, getting through the early struggle? Um, I don't have a, a, a nice answer you're going to like to hear, yeah. uh, Christian. This Christian? Sorry. Yeah. Um, my answer to that is always, if you have to ask a question, it's not the time to do it. If you have to ask a question, you know, what, is it right for me, or how should I do it, or what should the idea be, it's not the time to do it. You will know because something will resonate and you'll say, I'll do it with that. Uh, and I, and I, it's my own experience. Uh, 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 that's all I'm sharing with you. It's not, I, I'm not speaking ex cathedra. Uh, I just what I've observed is that when you know it's time to start a business, that's the time to do it. If you're still asking people questions, there's nothing wrong with asking people questions. But you want to get to the point where you're not going to ask questions anymore. Um, I recommend one book, uh, it's, for those of you who are thinking of starting a business, you're not sure about it yet, it's a very counterintuitive book. It's not part of the usual rah, 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 we've all got a right to start a business in four bucks and uh, two hours work a week. It's called The Entrepreneur Equation. And it's by a raving nutcase called Carol Roth. Um, but she's a friend of mine, and her book is brilliant. And it's a brilliant book about why you should be very, very sure before you start a business. The entrepreneur equation. Um, well worth getting. One up there. Um, did you ever find that you, in one of your own businesses you got to the treadmill stage? And if so, did you get out, or what, what happened next? Yeah, the tool and dye manufacturer that um, I was part of, it wasn't actually technically a startup. Uh, I bought into it whenever they were trying to reboot uh, they'd been in predictable success, and then the industry changed for reasons I'll not bore you with. There was a technology shift. They went back to Whitewater. And we shot through predictable success into treadmill in like months. Like months? What am I, 20? <laughs> <laughs> you need to, you know. Anyway. Um, that's because of him, you know. I'm starting to say like and stuff like that. Now. Um, so we shot through uh, predictable success really quickly, and, and I did. I bailed out. I, I'm, I'm not built for that, and my own business is resolutely here. It's, I've stayed here quite deliberately for the last 15 years. I, want, I like fun. I want to stay there. Predictable success is a wonderful place to be, but the only reason that you would go there is if you want to scale, and I've been happy with that so far. Three weeks ago, that picture changed, and I now do what I'm told, but... 
until then, I'm, I've been in fun. I was wondering if you could tell us about one of the failures, one of the two failures you've had. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Very kind of you to ask. <laughs> um, when's my next therapy session booked? Is next Tuesday? Uh, I bought a, an an economic uh, a publishing company. They were they produced very expensive but uh, thin and highly researched reports on economic trends in the United Kingdom. And uh, these were selling for about three and a half thousand pounds, about five thousand dollars a copy. So we didn't need to sell an awful lot of them. Um, but we did have a sort of trapped uh, group of people who would buy them. And I just didn't, I got blindsided entirely by the interwebs. Um, you know, now of course it's duh. But then primary research was very, very valuable. And curating primary research into a consumable, readable document. So we had, there was a whole bunch of uh, essentially economics uh, doctors, 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 who were writing this stuff that was unintelligible but really, really good. We would pay somebody who understood how they talked to turn it into intelligible prose and sell it for a lot of money. And then the interwebs killed the, the whole model. And I was too busy with my eye somewhere else. We should have gone with that, but and we just had to shut it down eventually. So again, thank you very much for that question. <laughs> you said that one of those uh, stages, or three of those stages are safe harbor, but one of the safe harbors was an illusion. Is that the uh, big rut, was yeah. that the illusion? Yeah, when you're in a big rut, uh, because uh, the difference between uh, the big rut and uh, treadmill is this ability to self-diagnose. When you're in the big rut, you think it's lovely. Uh, people like it that way. That's how they want it to be. And so everything seems very comfortable. Uh, but customers are just a pain in the neck. So and you've got, typically got a lot of money on a very strong balance sheet. But I mean, I get a, a talk out of, uh, let me talk, we're, we're recording this, no, I'm not going to talk out of it. Um, another client of mine is, has been in the big rut for a long, long time, but they have billions of dollars, billions of dollars. So they have feel no pressure to change. You, me you mentioned something about uh, big routes. Uh, big, big what? Big route. In the, uh, Compliance, which takes the company from going away from the Yeah, I was actually talking about treadmill here. In predictable success, we start doing things like we do Kaizen, Six Sigma. Um, you know, we do things to, to improve. We use systems and processes. As we move into treadmill, what starts to happen is if you try to do anything, people say, have you done a Kaizen on that? Have you used Six Sigma? Have you filled in the checklist? And so you've got the thing that you want to do improve, uh, reduce customer returns, let's say, for a, a sales business. And that's what you want to do, but the processes and systems that you have to do to do the thing become more important than the thing itself. Have you done the Kaizen? Have you filled in the checklist? Have you taken the focus group? And there's so much of, of an emphasis on compliance to the systems and processes that we lose sight of what's going on here. I'll give you two simple examples that have stuck with me uh, in recent months. Uh, one client of mine. They were so busy, they're spending a fortune to make their website HTML5 compliant. And it sucked, but it was compliant, right? And another uh, client goes, it something sayable, if you don't use the precise Pantone color of their logo on their materials, and their materials suck. <laughs> so you gotta say, you're here, because you're emphasizing, there's nothing wrong with compliance, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is our Pantone color, we wanna keep our brand, but it's gotta be that in order to impress our customers and clients. Yeah, yeah, okay. We done? Yeah, I think we're good, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.